É um prazer tê-los aqui no nosso primeiro Summit da América Latina. É a primeira vez que esse tipo de evento é, acontece aqui na América Latina e, e, e é, é imensa a nossa alegria de estar aqui com clientes, parceiros, futuros clientes. E, se tiver algum concorrente aqui, por favor, sejam muito bem-vindos. Hoje à tarde nós teremos bastante coisa para fazer e a gente vai é, iniciar é, com um vídeo do nosso, do nosso presidente, ele infelizmente teve uma, um, um contratempo para estar aqui, e aí ele vai, a gente vai começar o evento assim, a gente só queria falar alguma coisa para, de novo, desejar para vocês um excelente evento. Hi everyone, this is Tyler, I'm CEO of WSO2, and this is our second annual API Summit being held down in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. I want to personally apologize to all of you. It had been uh, my long-term plan to be down there and visiting with all of you to give the opening keynote. Unfortunately, I had some last-minute business, and instead of being in Sao Paulo, I'm, I'm currently in Colombo, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, taking care of some matters that cropped up here. And in my uh, place, our founder and CTO, Paul Fremantle, Uh, we'll be giving the opening keynote in just a couple of minutes. Um, today is an opportunity for you to learn, network, and connect with other colleagues that are working in the digital transformation space and to talk specifically about APIs and how the world is becoming an API-driven world all around us. Uh, you may not be aware of this yet, uh, but 25% of the Internet's traffic now flows through APIs And on top of that, 25% of the world's revenue is now API-driven as well. And, and that is a, a, a significant change in the world, considering that the concept of an API didn't even exist until about 10 years ago. And according um, to some well-regarded analysts, there's going to be more than a trillion dollars of revenue up for redistribution because of the impact that APIs are going to have on the development of omni-channel experiences. So it has become an API-driven world. Integration is the technology and backbone that allows us to deliver on our API vision and the API economy that's out there. And, and today is a wonderful opportunity uh, for all of us to connect um, and discuss these trends and the important technologies that are happening around these trends in support of them. I hope you have a wonderful day. I, I will get down to Brazil and Sao Paulo for a visit um, in very short order. And, and in the meantime, I'd like to introduce Paul, um, our CTO and founder, uh, for his discussion here. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, and, uh, and I thank you all for turning out. It's a great crowd. Uh, there were a few complaints this morning that there weren't quite enough room. And we apologize for that. We weren't expecting this many people. So, but it's fabulous to see you all. And um, I, I'm going to talk to you about APIs and the API-driven world. But uh, I also have a slightly different take on the world than, than Tyler. So I'm going to mix it up with a little bit of my own ang angle on that. Um, so I hope, I hope it doesn't. Um, I hope you enjoy it. So do we have any mathematicians in the, in the room? Any mathematicians? No, not a single mathematician. So if you were a mathematician, this is, this is an amazing formula. This is all the most important uh, symbols in mathematics uh, joined up in one formula that's true. It's, it's a piece of incredible, it, and these are things that, that come from different areas, from logarithms, from uh, complex numbers, from circles, Uh, and, and the base units, and, and they all work out. So mathematics, oh, when I was a kid, I loved maths. It was, it was simple, beautiful, clean, wonderful. And I studied maths at university. And then I also loved physics. So you know this formula, right? Everyone knows this formula. Again, this is, this is one of the most fundamental parts of the world encapsulated in, in four symbols And it's amazing how simple it is. That's why it captured everyone's mind. And then we have biology. I hated biology at university. This is a biological equation. 
Right, this is what biology equations look like. This is, a genet this is showing how uh, gene transforms happen in DNA. And, and it's hellish. And I was like, I can't, I can't learn all this rubbish. It's, it's there. But since, since more recently, I've realized that biology is actually much more useful than maths and physics. And that's because the space that we're in, computing, has become very complex. And biology is the study of complex systems. You know, when, when I was a kid, I was chatting over lunch uh, with Juan Pablo and, from Argentina, and, and we were talking about uh, how we used to use DOS computers, PCs with DOS on them and two floppy disks, all single tasking, and that was what computing was, right? Now we have monstrous complex systems. It takes one two years even just to understand the, the systems in one enterprise. You know, if you sat down and you tried to understand everything, you could spend years studying. And so we need these complex models. We need to treat this as a difficult problem, not a simple problem. And so that is where, where some of where I'm going to come from today comes from. But, but first, I'm going to give you a little bit about WSO2 and where we're going and what's happening, and then I will explain where, where biology comes into APIs and API-driven systems. So this has been an amazing year for open source. Uh, you know, and Brazil is in many ways more of an open source country than any other country in the world. Uh, and so this has been, you know, these are not uh, these are not Brazilian companies, but I can imagine that there are a number of Brazilian companies that have done well this year. So Red Hat, the biggest ever software transaction. Uh, MuleSoft, I don't really, unfortunately, call open source anymore. Uh, I think they moved away from that route, but they are still considered open source by some people, and, and obviously a very big transaction, $5 billion. Um, the merger of Hortonworks and Cloudera, worth $5 billion. HashiCorp just got a $2 billion valuation. So the, it's been a massive year for open source. And of course, we are all asking what's going to happen to Red Hat uh, at, under IBM's tenure. You know, what does it mean? You know, there's a phrase, I, I worked for IBM for many years, uh, and I was involved in the acquisition of some companies. Uh, I was involved in the acquisition of Data Power. That worked quite well. Uh, I was also involved in a company called Crossworlds. I don't know if any of you remember Crossworlds. Not such a good acquisition. They got completely smothered by IBM. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of examples of that. So we'll see if Red Hat can keep the open source spirit alive within IBM or whether there'll be problems. But it's going to be an interesting few years coming ahead for that. We have had an amazing year. Uh, we're now more than... 500 active subscription customers uh, with thousands more deployments, uh, trillions of transactions a year, and millions of open source contributions over our lifetime of, of happening. And, and we are growing around 50 to 60% on our core measure, which is the annual recurring revenue. So we're very, very pleased. It's been a great year for us. And it's been a great year for our customers. We've had a, some amazing projects come out. Um, and, and we're very proud that we now consider ourselves a truly global company. We had more business this year from outside of the US than from inside the US. So we are a US company. But this was the first year where we beat the US with all the other countries. So we're very happy. So I think a big round of applause. You know, so in Latin America, we have obviously a lot of projects here in Brazil. We have projects in Ecuador, Argentina, Peru, Chile. Uh, the list goes on, and, and we're very proud of that and, and what the team here have done. So, you know, Edgar, Luisa, Laura, all of you guys are doing an amazing job here. So, very good. And, you know, what is driving this, this shift in integration and in, in APIs and everything, that there's this customer demand. And customer demand has created this push for large companies to meet bigger and bigger systems and to be more and more agile. 
And that customer demand has been followed very clearly by one significant thing, which is the disaggregation of systems, the splitting up of systems into smaller and smaller components. We were talking at lunch about mainframes. So who's, who here has used a mainframe? Right, yes. Who here has used a client server system? Who here has built an API? Who's used serverless systems? So we all know this story, right? This is a story that has happened over five decades of increasingly disaggregating these components. And this disaggregation is actually making integration more and more important. I think there was a few, you know, a situation maybe two or three years ago where integration seemed a little bit boring. You know, everyone's into DevOps, cloud native, all the cool stuff, all the cool kids were no longer doing integration, right? And, and uh, but actually, the, the desire for integration is more and more important because each of these components needs to be integrated. When we build applications today, we build them by connecting other components together, not just by building a single monolithic system. So integration is, is really important. And most of that integration is happening through APIs. So Wells Fargo are creating digital applications that help people integrate their financial systems into their everyday lives. In London, Transport for London is creating a digital first approach to linking up the underground, the bus network, all the roadworks, everything that happens in London to get people around the city faster. Maybe we could help Sao Paulo with the same thing. I think you have some traffic problems. <laughs> Maybe you could have some help with. Um, and this is all based on APIs and integration. Uh, the English Tax Authority, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, are using uh, WSO2 to expose APIs to make it simpler for people to automate their tax returns and to automatically pay taxes. That may not be popular, but it's, it's useful. Uh, and the Bank of New York Mellon has created a system that they, that they use, but they also sell on to their partners. Uh, it's called Nexen, and it fundamentally drives their whole business and the flow of money across 10,000 credit unions across America, all based on APIs and all based on WSO2 integration. We have a very large Australian airline. I can't mention them, but they are very large, and they are Australian. So I'm sure you can uh, figure out which... ...hone in on in a minute. And this is a quote from Randy Hefner, which is that I think is really key. He's saying that APIs create agility that, that allows you to continually adapt to an unknown future of constant change. So everything is going to change, we know that, and one way of dealing with that is to build APIs that allow you to recombine, reconfigure, and transform. And, and that is something that Gartner also agrees with. So they say that 50% of all the time it takes to do digital, digital transformation is spent on integration. Every digital transformation project I have been involved in involves APIs, but those APIs are fundamentally integrating to back-end systems and linking new and old systems. And this is a really key aspect. That, that integration is suddenly one of the most important things there is. Uh, and it's very, very important to all the kind of transformation that's happening and that you guys are involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. And we are see increasingly seeing our customers start their integration with an API strategic view. And I think this is really sensible and I'm going to talk more about some of, the, some of the science and some of the, 
the anthropology, the biology, some of the metaphors that help us understand why this is so important. But the API management, I think, provides one of the solutions that we, we failed at with our SOA approach. So I think in SOA we made mistakes, and I'm willing to admit those mistakes. I've been involved in service-oriented architecture for uh, a very long time, nearly 20 years now. And uh, that, that time has given me time to reflect on the mistakes we made. And I think the mistakes we made were about human nature. We, 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 we tried to fit the human nature of our teams inside large organizations to the technology instead of fitting the technology to the human nature. You know, it's easy to write code changing people's human nature and the way we have evolved over a million years. That's difficult, right? So it's better to change the technology than assume that the people are going to adapt to the technology. And so we believe that 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 human aspect, the people, the process, and the technology are just as important as each other. And so over the last year, we have added to our core technology the idea that we also have a methodology and an architecture. And the architecture and methodology go hand in hand to help push the technology and make it successful. So this is a big shift for WSO2. We have been known for, for, for nearly 14 years for having leading edge technology, but I think sometimes we've been known as being too geeky, too technical, and we are trying to not, not stop being geeky, but also understand how this technology fits into, our, into organizations, into enterprises, how the architecture, how the methodology, the agility all come together to be more successful. And I think that's a really good move. We just got named a leader by Forrester in their API uh, analysis. And the only other leaders were IBM, Google, Software AG, and Rogue Wave. As you can see, Rogue Wave is a very small uh, dot there. Um, and, and it's really nice to be up there. I, I don't agree with our position. I had a lot of arguments with Randy Hefner about the technology uh, because uh, we solve a lot of problems through our multi-tenancy framework. So the multi-tenancy allows us to do a lot of very clever things that our other competitors cannot do. So the API marketplaces that are being built with our system, the federated view of APIs is something that Apogee and IBM cannot do, but you know that's one person's view. Uh, Gartner also had us as the most uh, high-ranked innovator in their space, in their innovation space, in their quadrant. So I think we're doing very well in this space. We know we can do better. We know we can do even more around APIs, around enterprise architecture. We believe that there are seven different fundamental uses of integration. So these seven fundamental ways of doing integration drive different challenges. And we are not a leader in all of these today. We want to be a leader in all of these. We see this as absolutely vital. So API management, we, we are the open source leader by a long way. Application integration, we are the world's number one open source company, uh, but there is still more we can do in this space. B2B integration is a space we have not really dealt with, but we have a partner who is very strong in this space, and we are looking at how we can work more closely with them to support EDI, JD Edwards, and that kind of integration. Data integration is a space where, where talent and Informatica have really been the leader. We believe that there is a lot more agility to be had in that space. We think that there is a, a new 
wave of data integration that is going to be much more agile, especially in a microservices environment where data is no longer in, in a single system of record but is spread out. And we are doing more and more to, to challenge that, especially with stream processing and event-driven architectures. Uh, the digital integration hub is where people use APIs and an integration hub like an ESB together to build a single uh, central hub for, for, for digital transformation. This is where most of our new customers are coming. So uh, more than 50% of our new customers today are using APIs with the ESB to do digital transformation. Event streaming is a space where, where we are still small, but we have leading technology. Our event processor, the WSO2 stream processor, can do 100,000 events a second, highly available in a simple two-node cluster. Everybody else requires you to have at least six to eight nodes to handle more than 100,000 events a second. We have, and we have uh, scenarios where Uber deployed this and we're doing a million events a second, uh, trillions a day. We also have an uh, IoT solution. The IoT solution we decided uh, was a, a tricky fit with the rest of our products. And so the leader, Sumeda, who ran that within WSO2, has set up a new company that is licensing the software from us and is going to lead just in that space. And we are going to work very closely with Entegra on that. So we see this as letting a new company form uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of WSO2, uh, creating something new, and we're very excited about that as well. So these are all the things that are good, but not everything is good. Right? Not everything is perfect. Uh, and and I, want to, I want to be a little bit humble here and admit where maybe we got things wrong a bit. So this Agile report from earlier this year says that 60% of organizations are doing Agile projects, but only 4% are seeing agility at the enterprise level. Only 4% say that they see agility at the, at the, at the front edge with, between them and the customer. Now, why is that? Well, let me start this discussion with a quote from a physicist, which says that an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes that can be made in his field. And I feel like that man. I feel like I've done every possible mistake that can be made in service-oriented architecture. And one of those mistakes is that I think that integration is the bottleneck. At least one part of that bottleneck between, between the 59 and the 4%. Because it's individual projects are agile, but when you want to be agile as an organization, you have to be agile across projects. You have to be agile in your integration. And unfortunately, not all integration has been agile. So one of the biggest problems in enterprise integration for agility is this thing called a center of excellence, a COE. I, I had a very embarrassing discussion where I was invited to talk to one of our customers. They had organized a day. And I came and I gave my talk about why the COE is bad. And the day was organized by their center of excellence for integration. And the leader of the, the team had invited me, and I gave a talk saying, I'm sorry, your organization is a problem. Uh, she wasn't very happy with me. But she understood what I was saying, which is that when you have a, an integration team that is centralized, and a data team that's centralized, and a messaging team that's centralized, and a security that team that's centralized, every time you talk to that team, you're creating a new gate. So even if your overall process is aiming to be agile, in fact, those gates turn it into a waterfall process. 
You can call this a fast waterfall. I don't know if this will translate into Brazilian, but I have a customer who told, tells me they call this wagile, which is a mixture of waterfall and agile, wagile. And this is really what I'm saying about our realization that we need to focus as much on people and processes as technology. We spent a lot of effort inside WSO2 on trying to make our technology support Agile. So the ESB has multi-tenancy. It has independent deployment of in flows. So the idea is that different teams could be deploying their code with different life cycles. But unfortunately, the COE model stopped that from working. So, so we didn't think enough about the people and process. And so even though the technology supported Agile, the people and process didn't. So the Agile Manifesto says some really interesting things. It says that the best architecture's requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. It says that Agile processes promote sustainable development. And they, it says that if you deliver working software frequently, that the time scale is more important than the function. It's better to deliver on a, on a fixed time frame than to wait until it's perfect. And the one thing I really like about this is this idea of a self-organizing team. Now this is, what is a self-organizing team? A self-organizing team is one that does not have a command and control structure. It's not hierarchical. The team itself works to figure out the deadlines, the schedules, the technology. Does everybody know what I mean by a two pizza team? This is Jeff Bezos's idea. So a two pizza team is a team that can be fed by two pizzas. Now, this is an American pizza, right? It's a big pizza. So it's not, in England, a two pizza team is just two people. It's not, a, it's not really a team, it's just a marriage, right? <laughs> but I don't know, I, what's the equivalent in Brazil of pizzas? Two pizzas. Two pizzas, okay, all right. So this is where I want to talk about biology. So in biology, the fundamental building block of every organism, every plant, every animal, is this thing called a cell. And a cell is really what stops us from being a pile of goo on the floor, right? A cell is what gives structure to every living thing. And this is an important thing because we need to learn how to give a structure to our, to our computing systems, to our enterprise computing systems that is adaptable, that is effective, that, that takes on some of the characteristics of biological systems. And this is a picture of cells. And what do you notice when you look at those picture of cells? You notice the boundaries. The boundaries of cells are made up by something called a cytoskeleton. And it is, a, it is, the, it is what separates out the cell into a useful system. The point of a cell is that it has functions that happen within the cell and then it has communication with the rest of the organism via that cell boundary. And that communication happens through something called a transmembrane receptor and a transmembrane signal. So the cell boundary only reacts to certain chemicals. All the other chemicals wash past it and it doesn't react, and then certain chemicals react with it and signal through the cell boundary and cause something to happen on the inside of the cell. This is very like an event-driven architecture. An event-driven architecture, you have a big bus and certain people react to certain messages and everybody else ignores them. This is actually how WSO2 works. We have crazy email mailing lists that everybody hates, it's, it's gone absolutely mental. But the point of the mailing lists is that 
everybody sees all the signals and certain people react to them. It's, it's like this. And the idea that we have is that we need to recompose, we need to break down this layered architecture and recompose it into a cellular architecture. And each cell has a certain set of function and within the cell you can communicate any way you like. You can have your own data plane, your own control plane, but across the cells there is constrained information. Those of you who know WSO2 for many years will notice that this is very like OSGI. OSGI hides capabilities as much as it exposes them. That is one of the most important things about OSGI is the ability to hide the internals of a, of a module from the rest of the world. And that is what gives you composability. Composability is more about hiding than exposing. Composability is more about that membrane, that cell boundary, than about the, the interface, the, tr the signals. The signals are important, but the hiding is really important. And this is also what I mean when I say that we got the, the SOA wrong. We assumed that everyone inside a large organization was one happy team, one big team, that we're all going to collaborate nicely to solve the enterprise's problems. And I don't want to sound cynical. I, I'm sounding cynical, aren't I? Zhao is looking at me saying, you cynical so-and-so. You know, we're all one happy team, you know. We're all, we should, but the reality is that teams work well in small groups. There is some maths behind this. If you have a team of 10 people, there are 45 connections between those 10 people. If you have a team of 20 people, there are four times as many. There are 180 connections. So there is something called relational loss that happens in large teams, which is people get stressed. They don't know the other people. So we were trying to, to assume something about how teams work that if we had talked to an anthropologist or a sociologist about SOA, they would have said, you're crazy. That's not how people work. People work well in small groups. And so those small groups need to have boundaries. And that's the point of a cell. So we believe that there is a... a this is a picture that comes from a paper that one of my team, Asanka, has written. And it charts the evolution of enterprise architecture from silos through an ESB structure to an API structure into a cell-based architecture where we have continuous agility and self-organizing teams. And I highly suggest you read this paper. It is on GitHub. If you think it's wrong, we want your input. So please submit a pull request if you think it can be improved. We're getting very good feedback on this, but we're also getting very good debate. We have a big argument about whether cells are mutable or immutable. If you want to join that argument, please come and join the, the GitHub issues. So cells are building blocks, and the point of a cell is it has a gateway. Now, typically, that gateway is a micro-gateway, an API micro-gateway. And the API micro-gateway protects both the ingress and the egress from the cell. So it gives a boundary. And that means that the team working within the cell can be as agile as they like, because they just have to, to agree to a contract. The contract not only that they are providing, but also that they are using. And as long as that contract remains the same, they can change from Rabbit to Kafka. They can switch from uh, HTTP to gRPC. They can switch from MySQL to, to Cassandra or Mongo. As long as they maintain that, that boundary, they can re, re 
reformat the internals of the cell as much as they like. And that gives a boundary and that gives agility. So that's the important point of this. But the point of a cell is it's not just an architectural construct. It's also an organizational construct. So the team boundary has to be the cell boundary. This has to be based on teams. And it's also a DevOps construct. This also has to be something that has a DevOps process around it. So this is about people, process, and technology. And we are evolving our stack to help this. So I'm going to talk to you in a minute about Ballerina. But as well as Ballerina, we are also doing other things that help with this decentralized architecture. We are building, we have shipped, as of earlier this year, a micro version of our ESB that lets you build dockerized, containerized, small ESB nodes that just have certain function. We have a micro gateway that we launched last year and then we evolved twice this year that allows you to create those boundaries. We are working on a micro identity server, a micro STS to give a, um, a secure token service for the, for the cell. We already have a version of CIDI that can be used in containerized and micro environments. And we have a new project called Celery uh, that you, some of you may have spotted something called Vic in our GitHub. Celery and Vic are related. Celery is a, an attempt to turn the cell concept into a piece of running technology. That, that pulls together these other components. Now, that does not mean that we do not also see a place for the existing components. So we have around 250 engineers working on the existing components and around 100 engineers working on the new components. So the existing components are still a very strong part of our story. And I will explain why in a second. Ballerina is a very important part of this story because Ballerina is a agile first, developer first approach to integration. Ballerina is, our, is a language that is targeted around DevOps and around developer flow. So who's a developer in the room? Hands up if you're a developer. So as a developer, we all understand that there is a, a, a cycle we go through you sit and you code, you build your code, you run it, you test it, you find the bugs and you go around, you fix the bugs, you rebuild it, you retest it, and you get in this cycle, right? And it's, it's, a, it's actually addictive. If you're not a developer, you should try this. It's great fun. So who's, who's been there and their wife or girlfriend has said, dinner's ready, and you've gone, I'll just be a minute, right? I'm just coding, I'll just be a minute. And an hour later, she's like, what happened? Sometimes even you, you think you've answered, I'll just be a minute instantly. And actually it takes you five minutes and you're in a little zone and you say, I'll just be a minute, five minutes later. You, you don't even answer the question. You don't realize where time is. And Ballerina is trying to bring that experience to integration. That is the aim of Ballerina. Where are we with Ballerina? We did our first real proper launch earlier this year at KubeCon in Copenhagen. We got a lot of interest and excitement. We have production customers. We have around 10 production customers today. Uh, I can't really mention any names. Uh, I can't mention Hewlett Packard. I can't mention Motorola. Um, but we have people using this. Now, these people are brave. I'm not denying they're brave because the language is not yet final. So the runtime is stable. We do an amazing amount of tests before each release. We do performance tests. We do long running tests. We look for memory leaks. So the runtime is very stable, but the language is still evolving and probably another six months. So we're targeting mid-2019 for a 1.0. 
but certain people have seen the productivity of this and they're like, I'm fine, I'll rewrite my code. You know, and there's something to be said for that. If it takes you one-fifth the amount of time to write your integration than it did before, then why don't you just write it now and then rewrite it in six months' time? It's still only two-fifths of what you would have spent doing it the old way. So there's some interesting things here. Now, I want to talk also about one more thing, which is that when we talk about flow and agility, it's very important that we, we also think about how we can measure these. So this is something called an MTT assay. And this is how you measure the health of cells in human, in biology. The more purple, the healthier the cells are. And, you know, there's this famous saying, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And I think this is really important. So I think it's really important that we start to think about the measures of our agility when we come to integration and APIs. And probably the most important measure is this thing called flow time. Flow time is how long it takes me from the business case to the production. What we call done, done. You know, it's not done, it's done, done. So that's a phrase we use a lot in WSO2 when something's shipping. And this flow time is something that's very important to us. So do we have any users of WUM in the room, the WSO2 update manager? So not enough. It's nice to see a few hands up there. So WUM is very important to us. WUM is our way of delivering updates to you. And it's very important for us because it helps us measure and reduce the flow time. So in other words, if we can get an update to you faster, then you can fix your systems better. And this is really important. So, and, and it's also important because WUM fits into the DevOps lifecycle much better than our traditional zip file deployment systems. We also have done a lot of work to add new delivery systems. So if you go to our website now, you'll find Helm charts, Kubernetes deployment YAMLs, uh, Vagrant, Docker, Docker Compose, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. You'll find a whole variety of new ways to get our software. We're making sure that those also fit with WUM so that you can not just get the software, but you can keep it up to date, bug free, and, and get updates faster. So this is a very important measure. The other important measure is this thing called flow efficiency. This is what I was talking about with those gates before. This is the problem with waterfall. Waterfall is that you wait for somebody else to do something, you are not being efficient. So flow efficiency is the percentage of time that you're actually working compared to the total time. So flow efficiency is how much time are you spending waiting uh, and how much time you're actually spending working on, on flow. So this is another important measure. There's one more really important measure, which is your time to recovery. So that's the time when you find a bug to when you're back to running. And of course, blue-green deployment, canary deployment, all of these DevOps processes are about reducing the mean time to recovery, which we also think is very important. And to help you with this, we have also created this methodology for agility, which is a paper that looks at different aspects of agility. It looks at the people, the processes, and the technology and it looks at them independently. Because some companies have great technology for agility, but maybe don't have the right organizational structure. Or maybe you have the right organizational structure, but the technology is holding you back. So this matrix helps you map out where you are in the agility story and what that means for your digital alignment as well. So to summarize, and this is a picture of a cell, by the way. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, 
you know, I, what we're talking about is decoupling components and then recoupling them. We don't believe that having 3,000 microservices in a single flat plane gives you any more agility than having one mainframe. You know, if you had a mainframe, anyone who remembers the mainframe will remember you had 3,000 Kix transactions, right? There's no agility to having 3,000 microservices because everybody is calling everything and you have no governance and at that point you cannot uh, you cannot change those microservices because you don't know what impact that has on everybody else. So we think that the cell boundaries require uh, are required to get real agility in a microservices environment. We also think that 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 those that those cell boundaries are important not just for the technology but also for the teams. The teams work best in small organizations and if you have a small team they can really be agile so they need the boundaries. And so the idea is that you are agile within the cell but you are versioned and gatewayed at the boundary. So I just want to finish with a little bit more about what we're doing at WSO2 not just from a technology point of view, I've talked about improvements to our methodology, our architecture. I've talked about Celery and Ballerina, our new technologies. I've talked about the emerging emergence of the micro ESB, the micro API gateway, the micro streaming. But we're also trying to change some of the ways we work. So one way is that we're offering this 10-year long-term support, which is to say that However much innovation we do, we stand by your, you as a customer and we will support whichever product you are on for 10 years. The second is that we are trying to change the way we interact with our customers and we realize that a, a stronger partnership is very important and the concept of a technical account manager to go alongside the business account manager allows us to create a better techn technology partnership with you. We are trying to improve the user experience, not just through the installation guides, through better technology, but also through the business model. Our aim is that anybody who comes to our website can get an evaluation subscription and get our support and our updates for long enough to try out the software and see how it works. Alongside our existing uh, instance-based pricing, we've brought in a new pricing model based on cores. This is not the number of cores one server runs on, but the total number of cores that your cloud runs on. And the idea is that you can deploy as many products as you like across that number of cores. This is very important when, when you want to get agility in a microservices environment because you want to be able to spin up and spin down instances of servers quickly in Kubernetes. So the ability to have a pricing model that is based around Kubernetes and, de and cloud deployment is very, very important to us. And we are also offering now a, a channel just to up get security patches. So some customers want to have all our patches, some customers just want to get our security patches. So these are all ways that we're trying to listen to our customers and meet them halfway and create a better relationship with the customers, not just around technology, but around our business model. We're also creating new and, and more presence out in the market. We just opened our Australia office. We've opened, we're opening a Berlin office within three months. Uh, we are about to announce what's happening in Mexico, which is a, a partnership with, with uh, one of our partners who has uh, who opened up a physical presence in Mexico. And we are rapidly expanding our partnership across the world. And we have done a lot of work around creating a new partnership model which allows uh, partners to share in our recurring revenue. 
not just to get a services revenue, but also to, to participate in our recurring revenue, to create new technology and community programs, and to create better collaboration with our partners. You know, we have scaled amazingly over, over, over our lifetime, but we realize that if we want to carry on scaling and accelerating that scaling, we cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it without our partners. And I know a lot of you here are from partners and I thank you for your participation. And I really appreciate your feedback on this new program. I think it's, we've got, we had a big uh, partner meeting in London two weeks ago and the, certainly the European partners felt this was a big improvement, but I'd really like to hear your, your experiences and your thoughts. So finally, I just want to finish on what our vision for 2019 is. The first is that we are going to continue and to extend our openness. We are actually going to uh, commit that every part of WSO2 is going to be open source. So for example, some little parts like our web, like our WUM was not open source. We're going to make that open source. Uh, some of our open banking, we, we thought might be more acceptable to the banking community if it wasn't open source. We're deciding to make that open source. Uh, we are going to focus a lot more on community. We realize that maybe we haven't, you know, we've been running as fast as we can to grow. And maybe at times we have not been such a good community partner as we could. And we want to really improve our community. We've spent a lot of our effort looking at our principles. We, we have a, you know, we, we're 13, 14 years old. We decided to go back and look at our principles. We got the leadership of the company together uh, for two days to just think about what the principles of the company are. And, and we identified six core principles. And, and I've been involved in this kind of exercise in other companies, and I was frankly a little cynical. Yes, Ja, I was cynical in this case. But really, I was very excited by this. I think it's, and it's really energized everybody inside the company. You know, one of the things we really strongly believe is that openness creates opportunity for people of every size. And I think you in Brazil really know this because open source has been a massive driver of opportunities here in Brazil. It's been a massive driver of opportunities in Sri Lanka. You know, we believe that openness and community create new opportunities. And this comes back to APIs. APIs fundamentally create new opportunities through openness. Every API allows small organizations to, to utilize, to band together into communities, into ecosystems, and challenge big companies, challenge the established uh, people in the market. This is what we're seeing in Europe with this thing called PSD2 in the banking industry, where every bank now has to offer op open APIs, and it is creating a whole raft of new financial services for small organizations that can do better than the legacy banks. And it's encouraging big organizations to do new things as well. So Santander is looking at this and saying, we have a new opportunity to be a platform company and not just a bank. So they, even large companies are seeing this as ways to market. And we think these principles are really key. And I talked about the other aspects already. So thank you very much. I know I've run slightly over time. I apologize. Uh, but I did fly all the way out here just to give this talk, so I wasn't going to just let them stick me to half an hour. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>